questions uh, for doing Q&A. And maybe one more thing, just for folks who might leave early, we will go ahead and post this presentation on our website tomorrow. Some of the text, I know is a little small, but this is the back, so we'll go ahead and get that posted on there. So you guys can come take a look at that as well, okay? So there's two of us that are running mics. Frost Polly will be over here on my left, stage left, I'll be over here on the right side. So if you're interested in a question, please raise your hands. Not all at once. Stunned, <laughs> stunned silence. <laughs> um, so you mentioned this, that it's going to cost millions of dollars to make this all happen. Um, obviously that sounds like an insurmountable number. Are there funds available or sources that we can go to for help with putting those, those dollars together? That's part of what the group is working on right now, remembering that we filed this notice of intent on July 1st. Uh, our first main meeting of these entities is this, the end of this week. Um, in the meantime, we're still actually waiting for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to bless this and say, great, you're good. Uh, let's see what you can do. Uh, and we have a series of excellent consultants we have uh, FERC attorneys on our staffs. Uh, we have been working night and day on that question and how to get there. Um, I can tell you that there are some interesting ideas, none of which have sort of gelled yet. And there will be funds available. And that's why it's important that our federal and state officials are on board with this process and the formation of this regional entity to protect this water supply. Uh, we're hopeful that funding will be available, both from the federal government and the state government. Um, and ultimately, people will end up having to pay more for their water. Um, but obviously, it can't be borne on the backs of 600,000 people who are the beneficiaries of the water supply on this side. And it will help us to have the broad regional coalition that can leverage funding from other funding sources, both in the federal government and the state government, for restoration projects, for example, and the monies that it's going to take to enhance habitat on both river systems. So we don't know the answer, the real answer yet, but it's, it's going to mean some changes. But it has changed. So. So I'm curious about some of the scientists that you've involved in engineers and already looking at some of the challenges raising uh, uh, Lake Mendocino Dam, taking out Scotts Dam. How is science being incorporated into planning and at what stage is it right now? It's a good question. Thanks, Helen. It, there are various stages. The two subcommittees I talked to you about with uh, water supply and um, fish passage are a series of not only um, biologists from National Marine Fisheries Service, Fish and Wildlife, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Youth Forest Service. Um, there are private consultants who are biologists that are also, also have been involved. Uh, scientists with entities like Sonoma Water both on the water supply side and on the um, fish passage side. A lot of work has been done. Um, uh, we're waiting for some final reports. Part of the studies that were being done by PG&E were hoping that we can salvage. Um, there was a company, a consulting company called Cardno, who had literally done already millions of dollars worth of that work. Uh, everything stopped on January 25th, literally stopped. The studies stopped. They were supposed to continue to the end of this year. Everything ended. So the studies are not completed. Uh, we need the answers to some of those studies. And so we're going to have to figure out where to find funding to have that continue um, and uh, get those reports done. As anybody who knows something about biological systems, you can't study a biological system in two months. Um, it's, it's even inconceivable to me that you can do it in a year and a half, which was what PG&E was tasked to do. So I can see studies moving forward for a number of quite a bit of time in the future. And hopefully some funding will be available for that. But a lot of interesting things happening, a lot of new questions coming up. Um, 
makes a big difference. There, there are questions about Scott Dam and its removal and the benefit of that and what some of the impacts of removal might be. We've got an issue with potentially toxic sediments behind that dam. Um, we are not sure of the habitat above the dam and how extensive it truly is. There are many other restoration projects in the Eel River that have been looked at and monitored and, and uh, categorized uh, that can use attention as well. So we've got a lot more questions than we have answers right now, but I think we're on the way to trying to coalesce it so that we can come to a closer outline of where we need to go, and that's what this feasibility study is gonna do moving forward. And we have to have that done by April of 2020. My question is, in this uh, appeal to the, to the relicensing and the little quantity of water that is being diverted now be the same after all the shouting is over with? I understand that a lot of people on the Eel River feel that the fish is being uh, cheated or not getting enough water to survive to get more water, which they could say if the amount of water being diverted could be cut in half. Is there any chance of that? Well, it happened. Uh, the amount of water diverted through the project was cut in half in 2004. And so instead of taking 4% of the total flow of the Eel River through that project, we're now diverting about 1.2% of the total flow of the Eel River through the project. Can it be reduced? Um, it's, I think anything is possible at this point in time, and that's why we're so careful to say that all options are on the table. We're going to base this, in fact, let me really quickly read you the eight um, objectives of the planning agreement that the four entities have, have uh, signed at this point. Eight objectives. One, minimize or avoid adverse impacts to water supply reliability, fisheries, water quality, and recreation in the Russian and Eel River basins. Two, improve fish passage and habitat on the Eel River sufficient to support recovery of naturally reproducing, self-sustaining, and harvestable native anadromous fish populations, including migratory access upstream and downstream at current dam project locations. Three, Reliance on best available science and engineering analysis is the basis for evaluating options for restoration, water del delivery, and hydroelectric generation pursuant to a new license. Four, collaboration on funding. Five, active participation of tribes and other stakeholders who are willing to support the other's shared objectives. Six, economic welfare of both basins. Seven, continued hydroelectric generation, and eight, protecting tribal, cultural, economic, and other interests in both the Eel and Russian River basins. Those are pretty lofty objectives. Um, it won't happen unless we have a broad coalition of people working together. I think probably the most important one of these items right here in terms of success is reliance on best available science and engineering. If we don't do that, if we base it on emotion, um, well, we won't get any of it right. It's not going to be easy. Also, I have another concern as to what happens to the people on the Russian River that have filed for water rights over the years. That's a really good question. <clears throat> um, your water right is only as good as the water uh, being there. That's right, but interestingly, the State Water Resources Control Board in their decision 1030 describes the Potter Valley Project diversion as having the appearance of naturalness. And because of that, they granted water rights to it from Potter Valley all the way to the ocean. Again, they aren't worth anything if there's no water coming through the project. So people will say to me early on, well, I, I'm not worried, I'm fine, I have a water right, okay. You do, <laughs> but um, the water's got to be there first. But the state board is coming to all of these meetings as well. Just so you know, the State Water Resources Control Board is very concerned, 
and they are actively participating. Um, hi, I have a yeah. Hi. I have a quick comment and a question. Um, I've heard a lot of um, misunderstandings over the last couple of years about the river water from both ends, both bases, and people thinking that um, it, it, the diversion is affecting quality of life in the river very adversely. But I was very surprised to hear that. Um, both rivers used to run dry in their natural way of in their natural course. So I think that's something that not everyone around our counties understands. My question um, has to do with FERC. What is their role and is there a chance that Washington can muck this all up for us? <laughs> let me let me start with the first part about the rivers going dry. Remembering that my comment was with regards to the upper main eel. So if you take uh, if you know the Eel River very much, and I have a a map here that any of you afterwards we can roll out and I can show you. Um, the upper main eel is one small trib of the entire Eel River Basin. Uh, it is the hottest, driest part of the Eel River. In fact, coho salmon don't survive and live in that part. And that's, coho are an indicator of uh, cooler temperatures uh, and more summer water, for example, or cooler conditions. So if you go to the Middle Fork, or the North Fork, those tribs, those major branches, run all year. And usually, they run very well, uh, particularly if we get good snow melt, because they're draining the Oldabolis. They're, you know, our little watershed up here has uh, Hulls Mountain and Sanhedrin. Uh, and often, those south-facing slopes lose their snow early on. In the last few years, we've had very little snow. So without Scott Dam holding back whatever runoff we have in the wintertime, there is no water that's coming into the main stem after a certain point in time. In fact, if you look at the nightly reports by PG&E of inflow to Lake Pillsbury, around about August and September, the inflow to Lake Pillsbury is a negative number. It's, it's very odd. But um, in a high in the little tributaries, there's, there's water. And um, some of you have seen the movie uh, A River's Last Chance, where it talks about the impact of cannabis grow on those little tributaries, where it's steelhead are oversummering. But the other forks of the river, the South Fork, a lot of the South Fork will go dry in, in the very driest of summers. But the Middle Fork, the North Fork, the Van Dusen all run year round. It's just this upper main eel. And then um, can FERC muck it up? Um, <laughs> Uh, FERC, uh, in my limited experience with them, because I've been dealing with filings with FERC since uh, the late 80s, uh, they usually run things very tightly. And so when a process begins, it has set timelines, very in-stone timelines. They'll ask you in 30 days to file comments. And if you don't do it on the 30th day, your comments don't matter. Um, then they get it back, and they make a decision. And they can take as long as they want to make their decision. Um, in this case, this is a new, a new situation, really, for, for FERC. It's not often that a co power company will withdraw a notice of intent to relicense. It has happened. It's happened a couple times in California in recent years, but it's not a common thing. And every single one of these situations is really different. It's not sort of a cut and dried relicensing. So they're being a little bit um, flexible so far. Uh, at first, when they told us that we had uh, 120 days to prepare a notice of intent, they then told us that we had until April 2020 to file a final license application, which FERC has been working on for four years. And so they were going to give us from July 1st to April next year to do what PG&E has done in four years. And we knew that it was impossible. It, it absolutely is impossible to be able to do that, because we weren't going to have the studies done. We weren't going to know how to finance it. We were needed to form the entity, et cetera, et cetera. So we went to Washington, DC. We talked with FERC, and they were very amenable. They were, they were very understanding. And so we'll see how it goes moving forward. It's in their best interest to make sure that this works. 
Otherwise, what happens is if this doesn't work and it fails, FERC could say to PG&E, now we would like you to begin the process of surrendering this license. And surrender the license is kind of a nice way to say decommission the project. And that would be a very, very expensive proposition for PG&E. Now we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And it also would be probably a huge headache for FERC because there would probably be people suing them right and left from everywhere. So um, I think that so far we're pleased with the relationship. We'll see how we go in the next uh, year or so. I got a couple questions. Um, what is the nature of the entity that will take control of the project if you're successful? And will it require a legislative act to actually create that entity? And if so, have either acquired or would be done any of those kinds of uh, procedures and committee? And uh, is there, that's one, is there a, Okay, you want that a, answer uh, first? <laughs> sure, go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, that's a process we're working on right now. Is, is what this new entity is going to look like. And we're just at the very beginning of those conversations. I believe it probably will take some kind of a state uh, formation of, an, of a new entity. Uh, it will include the counties uh, because it will include NGOs. Uh, it can't be something like a joint powers authority. That's my understanding that legally it can't. So what it ends up really looking like, there aren't a lot of examples of this happening in other places. So we're sort of, treading new ground here. Um, and stand to, stay tuned. Uh, hopefully in about six months, uh, we'll be doing this again, and I'll have some good information about how that's proceeding. But that's definitely uh, one of the top of our list. That plus financing. So on the financing issue, has there been any discussion of just taking this and handing it over to the Army Corps or your reclamation or something along those lines instead of maintaining it as a locally controlled project and having the feds pay for it? Have you ever worked with the Army Corps? <laughs> um, um, I think uh, the reason that we've been working so feverishly on this thing is to maintain local control. Um, I think that that's why moving within the, re the licensing process gives us some control. Once the licensing process ends, if it were to end, if we were to fail, local control of what happens to our destiny with this water supply and our ability to do projects to restore these habitats is, is gone. Our local control goes away. And that's the reason I think that all of us that have been working so hard in this endeavor, all of the entities I've been mentioning, um, understand that local control, regional control is Paramount. And then last question. Uh, uh, would the raising of Coyote Dam be part of this, raising the level of the casino? You know, are you actively looking for federal funds to do that? That is probably important. Um, yeah, in 2005, the Mendocino County Inland Water and Power Commission uh, became the local sponsor with the Army Corps of Engineers to begin a feasibility study to raise Coyote Valley Dam, which was phase three of the flood control project that the Army Corps envisioned back in the 50s. Um, it was to be raised 36 vertical feet. It never happened, probably for a couple of reasons. One, the 64 floods uh, came and went, and the dam did very, very well. Uh, it, over, it overtopped the spillway just a little bit, but uh, the Corps said, hey, look, that worked, so maybe we don't need to raise it, and so they haven't. Well, we've been in a feasibility study that's sort of been uh, staggering along uh, since 2005, and uh, I refer to it as a, like a brontosaurus with a broken leg. Um, it's a very tedious uh, thing, and it requires federal funding first and then matching local funding. If I have a choice right now of where our hard-earned local dollars go, it will be for this effort to produce a new entity and license the Potter Valley Project. We haven't given up on the feasibility study. Congressman Huffman has been very interested and very positive about doing it, thinking that it's one way to secure the reliability of the water supply here. But even Raising Coyote Valley Dam, which all the modeling has been showing from the water supply group, 
even raising Coyote Valley Dam, if you lose the Potter Valley project, it will not reliably fill in back-to-back -back droughts. It will go empty with a 36-foot vertical raise. So Potter Valley Project Diversion, maintain that, and maybe talk about raising Coyote Valley Dam. Back-to-back two years? Or? Two years. Okay. Yep. So it sounds like uh, the real uh, trouble now is uh, financing the feasibility studies, and then if we are able to finance the studies, that they'll actually be done uh, in time for relicensure in uh, 2022. <coughs> and so let's say that feasibility studies aren't complete by then, by the time licensure expires, then what is the likelihood of uh, the license? license continuing on a year-by-year -year basis like they did in 1972? That's very likely. And in fact, I can't even imagine that, I can't imagine that everything could be done uh, by the time that the license actually expires. And I think now the, the, the goal is to make sure that FERC understands that we're making more than just a good faith effort to move forward. And if we can prove that and keep, continue to move forward, I think that's where FERC's flexibility will come in. And we will end up with year-to-year -year licenses until FERC is convinced and we are convinced that this is something we can do. James? Hi, James. <clears throat> James, we're going to turn over to the public. We hear the phrase quite a bit, PG&E is selling off the project. PG&E is selling off the project. What we haven't heard is an actual price for a project of this magnitude. Which entity that you mentioned actually controls the price or will set the price, and when will that price be revealed to Mendocino County and the IWPC? At this point in time, um, well, even before this point in time, when PG&E was auctioning the process, they weren't, by the end of our discussions, going to sell it. They were actually probably, in a way, going to give it to us. And that's fine but someone still has to pay for everything that's required to keep it running. Um, so the, the idea of it being sold and a price for it, you know, if PG&E can't make money on it with hydropower, uh, probably we can't either. But the real resource here, the valuable resource here for this area is the water supply. And if we can continue to make power there, which is what we've agreed to do in, in this NOI, and why we're looking to FERC for a new license. We will have some income from it. And at the same time, we'll need to be able to monetize the value of the water supply. No. <laughs> How long will PG keep the water flowing through the tunnel in this process? As long as the license continues uh, under its current um, mandate. So they're required to keep it going? They so have to, year yes. To year thing, they would have to keep it going. Right. Right, based on, based on license conditions. All the flows uh, that are in place right now based on all the studies, all of that remains the same. They have to maintain the project. They have to repair things that fail uh, until a new license is granted. Yes? You mentioned other entities that may join this coalition. Uh, specifically, what do they have to do? What does Lake County need to do to be part of this coalition? They have to agree to that, those objectives that I read, those eight objectives. Um, there's some other boilerplate language in there that most agreements would have in them in terms of good faith. Uh, at this point in time, each of those four entities has uh, contributed $100,000 to this effort. Uh, I assume that that will be um, required or something else in lieu of some other, something they could bring to the table. Um, and they would need to be approved by the four entities that are already partners. Yeah. 
Any other questions? How much does it cost to operate this project per year at Columbia? When PG&E decided to auction the process, um, and we stepped up, Inland Water and Power stepped up. We were allowed access to what was called a virtual data room. We had to sign a non-disclosure agreement to get that information. And it wasn't all of the information that we needed to have. We didn't have things about dam safety, et cetera, et cetera, because those are, those are um, protected uh, by Homeland Security. So when, we, when all was said and done, we believed that it probably was somewhere that they were needed somewhere around eight to ten million dollars a year to run the project. So um, that's basically all the information we have. We haven't been able to get any more information from PG&E yet, and I, everything has been frozen with the bankruptcy. I assume that as they get, maybe even the P PUC might even require them to give us information as we move forward. Once we get the final approval from FERC, I think we're going to be able to get a lot of information from PG&E that we haven't been able to get yet. Does that include the studies? That's really a good question. Does it include the studies? We're hopeful that PG&E will have to pay. They, they owe Cardno, the consultant, a lot of money right now that basically everything stopped on January 25th and Cardno hasn't been paid. They'd like to be paid. Um, they have also got a lot of expertise, and they've got, uh, they've done a lot of work. There's a lot of reports that haven't been written. Um, tremendous amount of work that has to be done, and PG&E was in the process of doing that. We don't know what it's going to look like. In the past, it's been my understanding that Sonoma County Water Agency had let's call it the lion's share of interest in the water in Lake Mendocino, and that the use of that water primarily went to agriculture south of the lake and often for frost protection and irrigation in vineyards in Sonoma County. And now I see that Sonoma County Water Agency is included in the coalition and the list of goals, objectives that you've given includes agriculture, but quite a few other interests as well. So my question really is, has Sonoma County Water Agency evolved in some way in the direction of broadening or you know, agreeing to this greater list of objectives? Yes. Yes, the answer is yes. And, and I can tell you that <clears throat> the water agency has spent a tremendous amount of money at this point in time in just the two subcommittees for the congressman's ad hoc, the water supply subcommittee and the fish passage subcommittees. Sonoma Water staff has been working at this nonstop. And they've done a tremendous job. They're also joined by the other fisheries agency I talked to and consultants. For example, the Round Valley Tribes has a, a consulting company, of uh, McBain and Associates. And so they've been funding some of this work as well. But Sonoma Water has done really the lion's share of the um, hydrology, the modeling, a lot of the biological work, a lot of the studies, and paid for uh, quite a bit of consultant time as well. So they have been engaged and more recently have stepped up as a partner. Uh, do you believe that the project is viable with the removal of Scott Dam or is Scott Dam an integral necessary part of that project? Scott Dam, the way the project runs today, is integral for our water supply security. Can it be modified? Yep, that's what we're going to be looking at. Are there other changes that could be made? Possibly. We're all, I would say that the four partners are all slightly uncomfortable about this uh, agreement. But uh, we also know that there's a way we can do it uh, if we're all willing to work that way. And again, using good science.
Let's find out what this, where the science leads us. Going back to the $8 million cost of running the project yearly, that presumably is offset by the sale of the electricity. Do we know what that figure is? We don't have good figures for that yet. Uh, I know it exists, and we will find it. And that's part of the process moving forward. Neil. And is there any possibility of total privatization? Is there enough volume of water? And would the market bear the cost to buy the project and sell the water and make money or break even? Well, I, that's possible. I mean, one of the concerns that we had is, as far as inland water and power, when we decided to uh, bid on the project in the, when it was an auction process, was that someone else would step in, someone from the outside. And I can tell you it was very interesting at the beginning. I would get calls from Europe, from power companies, and New York and Florida and all of these uh, entities that that's their job, where they come swooping in and take over a hydropower plant like this and privatize it. And they understood the value of the water from what they'd read. Um, is it possible? I assume if we let it happen, it's possible. I don't know why we would let that happen. I was thinking doing it ourselves. Well, we're kind of doing it ourselves. Yeah, but we well, it, yeah, I guess we maybe, but at what expense? Remember that our ag, our ag economy only works if the water's affordable. You can't charge farmers in Ukiah Valley the amount of water that farmers pay in San Diego County, for example. You can't, you can't make a profit beyond a certain point if it puts the farmers out of business. So there's a fine line here. And I, it's a good question, but I'm hopeful that we can, we can do this on our own with, with this coalition, and we'll, we'll manage it and run it, and enough of a profit to keep it moving and, and have some money for projects that need to be done, capital improvements, et cetera. But at the same time, you know, we own it. We benefit from it. has to be. That's part of the main problem. Again, if PG&E couldn't make money on it producing power, neither can we. So we have to be able to run it, produce what power we can with whatever the new flow regime or however it changes, whatever the project looks like, and in the meantime, monetize the value of the water so that we're selling the water. And hopefully finding funding sources for restoration projects. Well, as well. A, that was another thing of the restoration of it, because obviously it's very old. Um, mm -hmm. And you look at Orville and what happened with that, because they didn't have a, the maintenance and the retrofits on it. That, that price will have to go in with everything else, so the water prices would have to be. Well, at, at this point in time, the project has been well maintained and improved over the last five years with a diversion, a new diversion system, a multi million dollar new above ground conduit, a new needle valve at Scott Dam. The Scott Dam is inspected multiple times a year by different entities. Uh, there's some talk about changing radial gates, but it's, it's well maintained and PG&E has to continue to do that. But then after they're gone, yeah, it becomes our, it becomes our burden, right?
section of this passage, uh, and I believe it might be portable, that they are um, actually going to try out in either in Washington or uh, in, in might even uh, change it to go to Canada because Canada's having a problem right now. And uh, I understand that it actually works. So uh, this might be, uh, a, it's a step in the right direction. I don't think that Scott Dam is going to stay uh, erected without volitional fish passage. So we, I think the coalition needs to push volitional fish passage, uh, the natural flow. There's a couple different designs, the one on the north side. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we, we need to deal with the habitat restoration in the upper hill. I think if we push that button, I think we can get everyone to work together. Because without fish passage, I think we're going up against a wall. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and that's the direction everything has been going with uh, Huffman's group and in conversations within our four uh, partner groups right now. Um, we'll have to see. We have to look at cost of that. We have to look at benefit. Again, we don't know how many miles. We have some estimates. One of the studies that pg e was in the process of doing that got dropped, which is really unfortunate, is they were ground truthing the actual miles of prime spawning habitat that were blocked when uh, Scott Dam was built. <clears throat> we need to have that number. We need to know what's there. Um, we need to know, know what the likelihood is of survival of fish if they can get over Scott Dam, once they get over Scott Dam. Not just the adults and their ability to spawn, the ability of juvenile fish to survive in, of juvenile steelhead to survive in the upper reaches of those, those tribs, and for the other species of lamprey and Chinook to be able to leave the system every year. Um, it's, it's a huge question. There's a lot of questions, biological questions, that still have to be answered. Some of pg &E's studies were going to help with that, um, but there will be more, even if we could get the answers to all of those 21 studies that were in the works. It would result in more questions needing to be answered. So. Hey. Anybody else? Yeah, is there any idea how long it would take if worse comes worse, if worse comes worse, and Scott were removed? How long it would take for that to happen? Oh. Uh, I, that's a really good question. A long time, I think. But in the meantime, I, maybe I, I don't have a good answer to that question. But being complacent isn't going to fix it. And, and, and thinking that it's OK if it takes 15 years or 20 years or however long. Remember, the last relicensing went from 1972 until 2004, when the final license amendment results were put into place at the project. 1972 to 2004. So no, I don't think it's going to be that long. I don't think anybody would allow it to be that long. But on the other hand, certainly this isn't going to happen tomorrow. Right. The economic it is severe. Well, and I think there needs to be a better understanding of what you gain and what you lose, whatever your decision is going to be. And that's why you take every single decision and you judge it based on the science. Is it good to notch the dam? Is it good to put a ladder? Is it good to take it completely down? You have to, gain, you have to weigh the benefits and the, and the impacts. All right, I'll call for questions. Anybody have any additional questions? So I appreciate you guys taking the time to come out this evening. <laughs> and uh, please, uh, again, uh, there's a close card in the back. It is important. Do you guys want to take a moment to fill those out so we can go ahead and get those turned in?